Okay, I want to call the meeting to order, and um, I want to make an announcement of audio video recording of this meeting, and I would like approval of the minutes of October 21st. Of, uh, so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we have um, Carol Reinhardt and Sarah Weinberg, Weinberger, who is here. And I want to thank you for attending the Committee on Social Services and Veterans Affairs. And I know when I talked with Sarah in regards to the agenda, I know you were going to talk about the review of activities for 2013 and the challenges facing the Commission and the future needs for the Commission to achieve its mission. So it's open to you. Well, I you have you probably got copies, and I yes, apologize for the fact that I have only one. I can see that you've got That's others. But, uh, <laughs> the brochure that was uh, at Tuesday night, Human Rights Day, and that uh, that really, as I thought about what to bring on paper for you, yep. I thought it's already been done. Yes. You've got it. This yes. is uh, we're really. Um, very pleased and pleased that the, this is an excellent brochure. Mm -hmm. It really looks great, doesn't it? And that's a yeah, You don't mind if I give this Please to Mary Majora? Absolutely, absolutely. Here we're, that goes with that telling so that it really, it really was um, kind of uh, fun um, to take a look at some of what we had accomplished. Um, this past year, it feels like we haven't accomplished as much. We've had lots of um, new folks coming in and the major, major, major accomplishment has been the Human Rights Day event. And that was spectacular. Many thanks again to Sarah's great work on that. Um, and so we, we, I saw this year as being a year to get um, the commissioners staffed and, and operating and to work with the ideas that we had developed last year, let me just say back up and say that on December 10, instead of having the kind of event we had had the year before, where we invited agencies from the city to come for lunch, which was also a very wonderful event, we were sparse enough in our energies that we said we need to just have a human rights day where we work on our and goals. We, and we uh, have a lot of new people on the commission, so it didn't people. make sense. That's right. That's right. Something that it did. As it happened, that was the day that we learned about the shooting at Newtown. In Newtown. Right. So it was also um, positioned in a, in a, rough, a rough setting. Um, and, and as you know, we've had new commissioners who've joined us, some of whom have um, not attended. Uh, when Agna has had a rough fall, and uh, when I articulated my concern about her uh, stressful life missing um, as many sessions as she's needed to miss, she did say thank you for noticing. So I know that it was timing has been hard for her. Um, and uh, we've been very blessed with Jordana D'Amato and Rick Hart's very hard work. They work very hard yeah. on the and they've been right they do wonderful to work with them. Their follow through has been really and good. Jordana and uh, Tanzania, Tanzania, um, Can and Edgerly has done. They have traded off with the note taking and have been really thoughtful there. And, and Tanzi did some really great things with our, our area schools for the event that we had last week. So we've had we've got really some very strong hearts. Um, we've got uh, new folks um, who have come on who I think are finding their sea legs. Um, uh, Julio Capo and Eamon Edge are our newest, um, in addition to Tansy. Um, and uh, Julio has published a, one of the columns in this year's uh, round of columns on human rights. Um, Amy did a fabulous job on the brochure, um, and uh, Natalia Munoz has been with us the um, longest, and she has offered to convene 
uh, the first three meetings of 2014. But I think she's not interested in being the chair. Mm -hmm. So, um, are they going to have difficulties getting a chair? Yeah. They yeah. Have, I think they are. And, and, and Jordana is, I think it's safe to say Jordana is having a baby in April. She would probably be the best person to chair the commission, but uh, I mean, I really think she's the only person at this point who could really be a, a capable leader. I mean, I think Rick would be fine, but Rick's really involved with ServiceNet yeah. um, and, you know, stressed out with that. And yes, and he was uh, newest new. to the community, I think, uh, Julio and, and Eamon are also relatively new, and that's, um, that's, that's, a, that's a, a growing thing that needs to happen. I think to be on the commission, it really does help to feel like you're part of this city. Tanzania is very active in her uh, seeking to, to do that as a young, well, she and Jordana have young children. And so and what, when so I, am I hearing that you're looking at, like when, when residents do think of applying, that we need to look very carefully of how long they are living here? Yes, and I think that, that when I met with the mayor, one of the things I said to him was that people should have lived here at least a year and know something about the community and they should have some sort of background. They don't have to be social workers, they don't have to be human rights activists, but <coughs> it's something that translates to, to they, they should have something that they can offer to this committee. I mean, when we had our retreat last year, we talked about what did we need and we wanted somebody, a link that could be a liaison with the school. So we were very happy when Gwen applied. Unfortunately, she hasn't been able to play an active role because of circumstances beyond her control. And we also talked about wanting a legal person. So when Tansy came in, that was fine. But I, I think we have to be really careful about who, not, I, I don't think we should take every warm body that applies to the commission. And I also think that it would be, and I said everything I'm saying, I've said to the mayor, mm -hmm. I think it would be really good if the mayor worked with the commission on selection. That's how it used to be with Claire, and that hasn't been happening um, with, with new appointees. People just got appointed, and they got sent to us, and, and we have no, um, nothing, in, no participation in the process. Mm -hmm. I think that yeah, I'm I am not interested in coming having it seem that we are unhappy with the people who are on the commission now, right now. What I am uh, aware of is that because they were appointed without any kind of um, getting appointed process, I don't think people really fully understood what we need in terms of workforces, um, and that that was part of what what has been a pattern uh, in the last year and a half of people who um, were not really um, ready, getting, I suppose, that, that what, what, had, what needs to happen, I was telling Bill a few weeks ago, months now, that I had been thinking about the organizing process of one-on-ones, that people need to do one-on-ones, they need to be um, seeing the meeting as part of the work, but just as the city council meetings are not standalone events, you can't come once a month or twice a month and and have the work done. That I think is true for this work also. Yeah. We we need people who are um, who are um, doing things and willing to step up and take tasks. There's been debate in the commission about whether that's a fair expectation of commissioners. Right, and I think that if you're going to be on the commission, you one of your responsibilities has to be to be part of a subcommittee, whether it's, you know, the Human Rights Day subcommittee or the Complaints Committee. And then if there's, it's pretty uneven, I think right now, in terms of who does the work and who just comes to meetings. And, and so I'm really concerned about leadership and what's going to happen. And I had asked the mayor to, I said, I really think you need to play a role in helping 
the commission to transition. Um, and I don't, like I said, he didn't take any notes when I spoke, so I've been hoping that he maybe acted like he heard what I had to say. Um, but I, I think that somebody from outside the commission needs to step in and, and make sure the transition is going okay. I'm, a, I'm, I'm pretty concerned about that. And I want to see the commission succeed, even if I'm not going to be on it, because I think it's an important organization in terms of trying to help build community in, in Northampton. It's under, under the new charter, um, this will become exclusively a mayoral appointment without the vet into the council. Um, is that right? Yeah. So wow. that is the new charter. That yeah, there's, that there's the committees right? and commissions that are appointed by the council. The council has committees that it, uh, this is a council committee that the president appoints. Then because it's establishing the separation of powers and the mayor gets to appoint his or her um, on commissions and committees. And usually the commissions that are comprised of citizens is come under the aegis of the mayor. So, but that doesn't mean there's no influence. I mean, to that extent, it's a small town, we're all friends. Yeah. But the, um, doesn't I think, I think it's important. I think when you guys did your retreat, um, you, I'm sure you came up with a pretty clear guideline of what it is you want. I think sharing that with the mayor's office would be helpful. We did that. Okay. Yeah, we did. And I said, yeah. I'm not with the mayor. Well, I'm with the retreat. Um, and 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 had a lengthy conversation, including talking about potential grants that might be available. Right. Nothing really came of it. Well, there was there was a lot of this plate in the last yeah, year. Um, sure. I think yeah, actually sure. now is not a bad time because actually the you know knock on wood. I mean everything will change, but the 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 last hanging shoe has dropped, and that was that this report of the police department, but. Um, other departmental issues are not outstanding anymore. There's no override taxation issues. There's no, um, I mean, there's, there's always fiduciary issues, but the fact is, is now might be, and no campaigning and electioneering and all that lot of stuff. I think you might find him to be more receptive to. Uh, well, I think one of the issues I talked about with him when I met with him recently um, was, I think, the commission needs to figure out what its charge is because I think under the new um, what's the law? I'm sorry, I have no charge. I flew in from Israel this morning and I got in at 6 a.m. So I am oh, not like all right. We're I don't have a brain. A I don't have a brain today. Yeah, welcome so. to two degrees tonight, sir. Right, <laughs> right, right. It was pretty bad there That's too, okay. but not like this. But um, under what's the, the law? Meeting. The open meeting law. Right. Under the open meeting law, I don't think, and the mayor agreed with me, I think he agreed with me, I think it's going to be really hard to have a complaint committee and to have, have a complaint process. There's issues around confidentiality, right. and, and as we've talked about it, it, it doesn't seem like that's going to be viable under the open meeting law. And so I think the commission really has to figure out what, what reevaluate its mission and they need the mayor's assistance to do that. Right. The enabling um, order that created the Human Rights Commission predates some of the open meeting law rules. Um, confidentiality was not really a consideration. Right. It could be done confidently, but that's, you're absolutely right. It's all public. Yeah. You guys are not an investigative yeah, body. Yeah, and when we had Alan Seawall met with us recently, and, you know, even I said, what if somebody just isn't sure they want to file a complaint? And so they talk to one of the commissioners and say, here's my situation. Do you think that this is, is worthy of filing a complaint? Even that, mm -hmm. you can't guarantee confidentiality right. for. And, and Jordana is a social worker, and I'm a social worker, and we both felt a real ethical conflict yeah. in, in terms of, you know, kind of violating it, even though we're not, this isn't our job, and we're not mm -hmm. acting as social workers. I know I feel really strongly that those values and ethics have to guide my my work, whether it's in the office or as part of the Human Rights Commission. Well, that makes perfect sense. And in fact, so, actually, I'm, I'm glad that you err on the side of confidentiality. And the yeah. It's, at the same time, then it's weak tea for someone who actually does want to file a complaint. 
mean, there's not a lot that you guys can do. No. And it, there wasn't a lot you could do ultimately either other than allow someone to at least feel that they had, had I mean, you couldn't offer them a lot of redress. No, options. but you know, surprisingly, sometimes people look at us as this moral authority, right. and and we've laughed sometimes at our successes, like where where a landlord or an employer would actually do well, something. That's pretty, I and, mean, you know, and I think I wouldn't belittle that because I think that has significant value. He doesn't have the value of law, and doesn't right. have the val and and he doesn't have the authority of law. Right. Anyway. Um, and. <clears throat> And it never did so, which was always a little frustrating for human rights commissions predating you guys. But I think with the open meeting law, uh, there's a great deal more gingerliness yes. about sending anything as a letter with a letterhead coming from the mayor's office. Right. And, and the concern has been raised, it's just mm -hmm. a much greater caution. Especially since so many of the, I mean, we haven't gotten very many complaints recently anyway, but. So many of the complaints have come from people with mental illness and vulnerable people, right. and I think those of us who've been on the commission for a while feel really protective of those right. people and don't want mm -hmm. to see them exploited in any way. Right. So, and, this, yeah. and so that brings up, so what is the Human Rights Commission about? Um, right. We haven't been getting as many of the um, groups coming to us saying, you know, we're bringing this, we got used to get a lot of those, we're bringing this resolution mm -hmm. to the city council with the human rights commission I still think that as well but part of the, part of the uh, part of the role that the human rights commission plays is being a place where you can come and complain right you know and so to raise that I mean, uh, and raise concerns right. you know but we the less active we are the less we're known and thought of and mm -hmm. other other avenues that people will use to raise issues and concerns. Ultimately, what it does, I think, is that it takes away from the city government a kind of role that makes a stand around the importance of what it means to be human in North Hampton. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think there's something about the laws and the vulnerabilities for lawsuits that make it a harder um, harder thing for the a city agency to do. Well, as you guys cast around trying to find, actually redefine mission, and I think I think it's a really critical mission. I think that, um, and and I understand the, the limitations, which are pretty frustrating. You might want to talk with Mark Carmi. But the reason is Mark Carmine was instrumental in establishing the Human Rights Commission all those many years ago. Um, so let me just say that we're both done, done. talking to. You know, we right. resigned. New people are done talking to Mark Carmine, but we uh, shot our wives. Well, yes, it was Mark Carmian, but it was Margie Hess. Yeah, yeah and and Marjorie, Marjorie has. Marjorie has, has oh, I know. She told me. And, and you know, and unfortunately, there's been some negative stuff that's happened in the group process of our meetings. And so people like Marjorie, I don't think, ever wants to come to a meeting again. She and, told me she was quiet. And, and so it's, it's, the group is fra somewhat fragmented. And so again, I think that's why it would be useful for the mayor or maybe you two to be involved in this transition. Cause I think that they're, they're, I think everybody on the commission, they're all good people, and, but they, they're floundering a little bit in terms of how to work together and in terms of what their mission is. Because the, the last few months, that was one of the topics of our meetings was, what are we about? What should we be doing? And since Carol and I are both leaving, we didn't feel like it was appropriate to be defining that. The, the new people need to, to come up with are that. You comfortable in public meeting expanding on what the divisions were? I think it was a lot of personality issues. Maybe I think there was. I think that um, one of the things that happened was that the subcommittee that planned Human Rights Day, of which I was very involved with, um, we worked really hard, and we would often bring 
back to the commission what we were doing, and we would only get negative feedback. And you know, we like one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to give awards out, human rights awards to um, a youth and um, an adult and an organization in the community that had gone above and beyond in their work on human rights. And there were so many, so much negativity around things like naming an award after Malala Yousafzai, the Right. A young woman, I mean, mm -hmm. that got voted down. You know, things that <coughs> seem to me... But I, I do have a different perspective. No, and, and I'm just giving you my perspective. Yeah. Well, uh, that's, all, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, so after a while, I personally just felt like, we, I, as a and I think I can speak for the committee, we felt really discouraged. And, and we felt like there was a rift forming and people were getting misunderstood. And I don't I think everybody had good intentions. I really do. I don't think there's a bad person on the commission. But when you, you volunteer and you spend we spent hours I can't tell you how many meetings we had for Human Rights Day and spent hours and hours and hours and then nobody ever said like, thanks for doing this, you know, at our meeting. It was always, well, we have a question about the end. And people should have questions, but I think you have to balance it also mm -hmm. with, with positive feedback as well. So mm -hmm. for me, that was discouraging. Yeah, and, because and I mean, you've always been so active without problems. So it's just this year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What were you going to say, Karen? Well, my perspective is that we are, we are a group that functions from two different paradigms. Yeah. I and, agree with that. And that the par paradigm of the efforts of the subcommittee was, surely you see we're working very hard and would thank us, and the paradigm of folks who were asking questions was a paradigm of, but wait, don't we have a vote? Haven't we got some inclusion to say what needs to happen here? And, um, and, it, and the two paradigms came into discomfort around the fact that you've got two hours once a month meet as a group to get something done and the group that's on a roll that wants to get something done wants to get something done. The group that's not invested um, has, has a different agenda about what they want to be doing during the meetings or how they want to have input and, and I will say that it was, it is true that it was, um, it, it was not, um, it is the case, I think, that people who are uh, passionate about justice don't always uh, use their most sensitive skills in raising questions. And so, you know, there would be a, an inclination to just, you know, debate about some aspect of fairness and justice is very, very understandable, but not helping get the project to happen. We're spending like hours debating whether the awards would be named. We wanted to name the awards after different people. Mm -hmm. And there were hours, hours, right, spent debating that. And then we said, OK, we won't name the awards after anybody. And, and then we finally said, you know what, we won't give out awards, which I thought was a really, I, that was like my idea. And I was really excited about it. And the, commit, the, the committee was, really, we spent hours, like we wrote up a description of each award. and spent hours thinking about, and we were really particularly excited about naming an award after Malala. And um, so it, it was it was just, I felt like we were being micromanaged. And there's, there's a phenomenon in the social justice community of forming a circular firing squad. Oh, yeah. And, um, wow, it, that's it, a good, yeah, that yeah, is. That's a good and description. In, yeah. in Northampton, we're and Amherst and communities, progressive or self-identified progressive communities yeah. tend to uh, fall into this cycle of, of, of having these type of conflicts. It, it may be, and part of it is if you're an activist and you're with a group of activists, you are predisposed and inclined not to organize an event. You're you want to be active. You want to you want to make a point, and you want to be, and so consequently, 
what happens is it happens more often than not. A lot of good ideas, a lot of good programs, and a lot of good intentions are um, are quashed because of this circular firing squad. I have also described it as we eat our young. A little more graphic, but it, 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 well, I think there is um, my life experience. I think has been working in diversity issues and group issues. I went to graduate school to figure out what happened, you know, so to get words to describe some of the kind of dynamics that have happened in groups. And um, and and but I'm so I'm a great believer, as you can see in taking the time to figure it out together and to learn what you can learn about justice in terms of how a group is working together. And what's frustrating, I think, is that, that um, I, I just reached a point. I mean, I was tired. I was ready right. to move on. So I'm not dissing the, the group process. I think they'll go there. I think they'll go there. But that some real group building needs to happen. And ironically, the it seems to me that even something as simple as saying, if somebody applies, and I know of a couple of people who are going to step up and apply for a commissioner appointment, I think it would be a really good idea to have people who are interested spend some time talking to commissioners first and say, what do you do? This is the kind of thing that, that somebody like Rick Hart did. He spent a long time with Dan and I spent a long time in my other office, cup and top. Or, right, you know, and even comfortable meetings. Right, that should be a requirement. That's mm -hmm. also a piece that I think is very important. You attend a meeting, you see how that functions, you talk to people in the commission, and then you go away and say, do I want to make a commitment to do this or not? And, and, and the last few appointments, we've scrambled to make that happen. So, uh, and you can see what a difference is made in the plank that's laid. It has far less to do, I think, with the people involved than it does with the process of laying those platforms. Well, so the my thing question well, is, because you're saying at least live in the city of North Denver for a year. Well, I mean, not if somebody does have the residents. field of being involved in human rights or civil rights, and lives here for about eight months and applies. Well, well it comes to the meeting. To say, really no, but I, I think that they need to, because one of the things that happened when we were talking about these awards, for example, and yeah. people would say, well, we, we, don't, we think you should name it after somebody local, but we haven't been living here very long, so we don't know anybody local. And I mean, that's the kind of stuff that would happen. Okay. So it's, I think if you're, I mean, I've done community organizing, and you need to know your community to be an organizer. Right. And and so, um, again, I agree with Carol, it doesn't have to be hard and fast because some people come into this community and they go like gangbusters and, and other people don't. <coughs> I, I will say, if, and I have, this is not an easy community to come into. No. Right. It's not easy to be new here. Right. And I, I, when I was appointed by Mayor Hayden, she said uh, that she thought it was a good idea to come onto the commission as a way of coming to know the community and getting known. So, you know, it is a it is a beneficial kind of, of way to to find a place. And uh, all those early meetings, not the commission, Heather Johnson is a fabulous person. I felt more welcomed mm -hmm. by Heather Johnson right. and many, many committee meetings I went to were activist meetings. There is very there's very clearly um, we do it this way ism in any community that's really reasonably small. And there's it's it's um, there are outsiders and insiders. And that is a I think that's an important dynamic to work against and to get good talented people who are willing to be commissioners, but being very conscious that that the welcoming incorporation is really important. Otherwise, people are left wondering, what, did I say something wrong? Have I not figured right. out what? Mm -hmm. Right, and I think Rules the people, the and I think Carol's right, the people who weren't on our committee, I I think that they didn't, I think they felt as alienated from us as we felt from them. I do. 
and, and that was a problem. My other concern is bringing new people into a commission that has not worked out its purpose. Right. I was just, I was going to say, mm. I think the mission has to be defined. Absolutely. And then once you define the mission, you can figure out what the body is going to be, what the rules are within that body, how it will function. And I think, I mean, I, some of the things that you're describing are essentially a, 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 a group at sea. That's right. Be, because the um, essentially the core of the mission has been modified due to circumstances beyond all our control, mm -hmm. and I think it's a revisioning of what the Human Rights Commission should and could do for um, the, the community right. is probably the first. Yeah, I think some objective. people really finding some people that who feel like they have a vision, right. you know, and have and are ready to think about that have some uh, passion for it, the kind of passion that Sarah brought for human rights has been what's held, the group held us together, I think, oh, in the everybody's passion for what we've done. But, it, but, but I think it is an important thing to really be on the lookout for, for maybe some people who um, have real passion and real interest in this. And, and, I, I'm, I am staying on the advisory board, and I have said that I would be willing to facilitate um, a process where the commission would spend a retreat time, you know, a, a, a longer time than just a two-hour meeting. Um, if I'm not, if I don't have a stake in the running of it, I could certainly offer my skills as a facilitator for, uh, you know, for a process of determining it. On the other hand, maybe there are better choices to help with that. So I think you just have to be careful my about, about not, no, 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 about like not getting roped in to them something. chairing the meetings. But somebody, whether it's you or you guys or the mayor, somebody from the outside needs to come in and right. work with, before you put new people in. Well, work with the existing group to, to come up with a mission statement. The, 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 the delicate situation for us is, as I said, the redefinition of, of committees and commissions under mm -hmm. the new charter. And I'm not sure I ever quite understood that. I, you once said something to me about the thought that, that something about the charter had changed and that I had got the impression that the commission would be, become a committee rather than a, a well, that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's I mean, it's possible. In that respect, it can be redefined as to what authority it has under and what appointing authority there is. And we should talk with the mayor about that. But as it stands, uh, with the transition, it is a mayoral committee um, making recommendations to the mayor and to the council when we, um, we were, as you noted, we refer resolutions to you guys, unless they come from you guys. Right, so and when it leaves mean? the mayor's office, it comes to city council and goes to appointments and evaluations. Well, well the... Because we've the, interviewed every one of them that... Right, new, new members do. Yes. Um, but that, that will probably... That, well, we still have some say in that, so... But by and large, it will be the mayor's um, committee for the time being until such time we... Uh, so while that and and that's we should figure that out too as as trying to figure out what the mission would be. And it might be useful to talk to the mayor about what his vision is for the commission. Right. And it, 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 what about your sense of need? What is needed that would come under the rubric of a human rights commission? That that's uh, what what issues that are not being served now are addressed. That there seems to be that I mean you guys. Have, a lot more. Well, I think I think we have a real educational function to, you know, let the community know what are some of these issues, whether it's, you know, like that's why I do my column, mm -hmm. what, like living wage, what my column is about today, or, or, or other issues. We, you know, put together when there was the bring our war dollars home resolution and the community got divided, mm -hmm. we put together that forum. I think there's a real need to educate people about what human rights are and and what 
what does a human rights community look like? What what would what kind of vision do we have for this city um, in which we create a city where everyone's human rights are respected? And I think the commission, because we have adopted the Declaration of Human Rights as our major paradigm, um, offers that has that to offer to the city. You know, we we want to show you, we want to build it together, and. So, I mean, it's, I know what I'm saying is kind of vague, but I really think that that's an important piece of what we do, is, is educate and advocate um, for, for marginalized groups to have their rights recognized, but to have everybody's rights recognized. I, you know, one of the concerns about the Human Rights Commission was that it was essentially a SOP. Some people thought it was a SOP, that it was a, just a feel-good kind of committee that made us uh, um, feel like we were striking the blow for social justice and human rights. And there were a number of councils who thought, no, we actually want this to have value and effect. This isn't just to make, this is right. feel good stuff. And, um, but consequently, it's, it's sort of always teetered on the edge of both those things. You know, I, I think in my own sense of the, what it should be doing, <clears throat> yes, summed up, and I think I used the word Tuesday night, and that is a bridge. Right. And that's how I see it. I see it as a bridge or a hub that gets, gets um, staffed with commissioners who are watching what's going on and on alert and conscious of the wealth gap uh, that exists, the um, needs that people have that are served by lots of fabulous agencies but that are, that are on alert so that as issues may come up, it doesn't have to be an individual complaint process, but as issues come up, the, the Human Rights Commission considers those and either develops resolutions or invites resolutions. Most often I think the Commission has been, a, it played the bridge role so that when somebody says, we've got this issue, we work with them and say, we will co-sponsor this with you. You've got to be enough of an organization yourself to have a lot going, and then we'll support that. But we're the bridge to the city council, and we bring, we bring something as a result of being an appointed agency for the city, that we bridge it and allow the city council then to hear, respond, vote, affirm, and it gets publicity. And so it's an educational process, but it's really rooted in the life of what's going on in this town. And um, so that's my sense of the, of both the, the role that even the complaint process can be modified, I think, so that it's really a place to talk about what are the issues. We don't have to be talking about whose landlord isn't putting in which water faucet and on what grounds is that discrimination. You know, we're talking about, you know, there's a body of folks out there who aren't getting buses, uh, right. which you know is one of my favorite right. things. And, you know, so I see, the, I see that council being people who are tuned into the city and ready to be tuned into the city. And here's an example. We put together this panel on immigration um, that, that happened November 13th, and it was part of the Hamptons Reed event, and it was an amazing night. I mean, we, we had a really good turnout. It was in the Coolidge Museum at Forbes, mm -hmm. and what was the most wonderful part of it, I thought, was the discussion afterwards, and some people brought up, you know, what, what can we do to welcome immigrants into this community, and, and what kinds of joint events might we have? And I was sitting there thinking, hmm, if I wasn't resigning from the Human Rights Commission, <laughs> this would be a great issue. Yeah. You know, we could take that as our single issue to focus on this year. It is immigration, and how can we, how can we, build more more knowledge and more interest in in the immigrants within our our own community. So I think there's lots of these. You know, we can take an issue and mm -hmm. and go to town, you know, just take an issue for a year and, and work on that. Um, mm -hmm. But we, we are the people who know what's going on in the community. We, we read the papers and we talk about things that we see and what should we do about this or that. I mean, we just got, you and I both got that email from Marty Nathan about, I didn't quite understand it, but supposedly 
this African American man have Jones. Had, had, at, uh, at, at Ruger's, and I, you know, I'm in Israel writing emails, going, "What should we do about this?" You know, it's actually we can talk about that because he's actually he's he really doesn't want it to blow up, but he wants he he um, he's tending to it on his own right now. But. Is he? It was a strange article. I mean, a strange he letter. He wrote in the third person about himself and that. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So yeah. he yeah. he was the person he that was brought. The person I wasn't. Was yeah. I was confused about that, and I thought I wrote back to Marty and I said, "Well, was this in the Gazette? How come this wasn't in the it Gazette?" Was, it's no. It's 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 throughout social media now. So <coughs> the I mean the one of the big issues that we were dealing with and that we have to deal with with going uh, forward into the new term is um, the conflicts that are manifesting in public space. You know, the bench issue that came up with the, right. the um, this is an issue we revisit every year and it brings up all the same biases and same myths and, um, you know, it'd be if you, if you, if you want to work it. But, Human Rights Commission will one one issue that would be an excellent issue, how we share our space and what it means to be a citizen as opposed to relegating some citizens better than other citizens for whatever reason. And maybe that's part of what the Commission wants to do is choose one issue and rally around that for the year. But they need they and what amongst them be it. Yeah. Yes, right. It's, great, it's, great, it's, great grandmother used to say. I think that's it. It's, <laughs> amongst them be it. She casts it on to them. That's <laughs> the George Bush yes. But we could get excited because we have passion for this. Right. right. <laughs> Let's just talk about your budget. How much do you have for a budget a year? That's there's, it. There's no money allocated for that. We all spent we money. Have a budget, we right? all spent money on human rights. Now I talked to the mayor about that too. There's just no money. But didn't you used to have a budget? Never we had, a budget. At one point we had some money. Like when we had when we had the pride march and they used to have the party afterwards yeah. and we'd have a table and we have a thing for donations and we had a couple hundred dollars at one point. There's but, no city yeah. money allocated. To yeah. No, but I know. Well, I'm just asking, Bill, yeah. what, if they did have a budget, because I was told you had one way back. We never, no, we never, never had a budget. Budget. At least as long as it's part of the deal. So everything is fundraising. Yeah, I mean, but they're not a they're not a nonprofit organization, right. so consequently they can't they can't really fundraise. They're not a 501c3. Um, it would have to be under the same way the Youth Commission does. So the Youth Commission raises money and then it's basically because I don't know what Okay. Um, and that's why there's little pockets. Kind of like yeah. was. And so exactly, <laughs> we used it to feed people two years ago for Human Rights Day. And this, t this time people donated either money or donated food for the reception and Okay. And the mayor's office well, paid for the uh, printing. They duplicated the program. program. It was gorgeous. That was well, very impressive. The decision was made to make it that cut in time so that it's it's created that it will, the brochure will need to have different names on it in the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank the both of you for your years of service on the Human Rights Commission and you're going to be on the advisory board. Sarah may also be, in, but you going to be probably busier doing other things. And, yeah, mm -hmm. I haven't decided yet. Well, one last quick thing that sure. I, I wanted to say that I talked to the mayor about too. Mm -hmm. and it has to do with the open meeting law. This idea that subcommittee meetings have to be announced, that you can't. If you're a part of a subcommittee, you can't like be emailing each other. No, you can't. We couldn't. We would not have been able to do Human Rights Day under that kind of law because so we we would meet like every other week for two to three hours, but in between, we were asking people, you know, did you do the program? Okay, what it what what about what do have you heard from this organization? Have you heard from that organization? And to me, it's. This is where the open meeting law ends up shooting itself in the foot. And well, when I talked to the mayor, he agreed with me, and he said yeah, he was yes. going to consult with Alan to see if there's right, some I mean, way around this. This is, I mean, 
This is all new to everybody in the state. It's the oh, new Martha Coakley had uh, presented them last year, um, and it was to respond principally to the um, increase of in people using the internet, because that clearly is not an open meeting. Right. The workaround for that was to write to individuals instead of and never hit reply all. Right. And we do it with the council if I ask them if to, when I remind them that we're going to do a group photograph for the last meeting. I ask that they not hit reply all because that's some aspect of it could be construed as some aspect of deliberation, even though it's not. There's not an item on the agenda. Right. It's possible the citizen may object, but I don't know. But the the um, and that's the purpose of it, to provide an opportunity for someone with a, a dissenting opinion to not be um, you know eliminated from the process and the transparency. But you're right. There does come a point where it, it becomes. Right. It, it, it becomes so cumbersome that it really it does not allow for efficient management of really the minutiae of these things. So. Yeah, this, I mean, I can understand that when you're talking about business that involves the city, but when you're talking about a committee that's planning an event, you know, it, it's and, and that has so we've met for a year, just about a year, mm -hmm. to plan this and. It was already so much work um, that... Yeah, uh, Rick talked to me mm. eight months ago. Right. Yeah, he signed me up eight months ago. Yeah, I said, yeah. I mean, when he first came to ask me, and then he said, I said, well, I'm really kind of booked up. And he, I don't know, we're talking <laughs> December. <laughs> 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 December. Oh, no, I said, I said, we remembered in 2009 when it got, we were planning it with another group, and it was done pretty last minute. It ended up being a great event. And I said, we're going to start this a year ahead. And it still ended up being a ton of work towards the Always, end. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's like, I don't know how we could have done that if every single meeting we had, and if we couldn't couldn't email each other mm -hmm. in between. You know, was, I mean, I was emailing people from Israel, you know, with last minute stuff. So but it's amazing because I even hear from people who are on committees how frightful they are about the open meeting. Yeah, yeah. And I heard that the legislature doesn't have to abide by the open meeting. No, no, no. It's frequently, uh, well, they do have to on some level, but not certainly on the level of municipal government. Uh, right. It's one of the What's cases of, of, well, they have more expensive suits. Yeah. Uh, they don't do salvation. Exactly. They don't do salvation or money. Exactly. They, so like they make the rules. They make the rules and abide by them. And, 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 and this has uh, been a struggle in every community. Every community is trying to. So, well, some, some Hilltown communities just say that. Well, they don't abide by, it, by any means. But um, I, I, before you go, I just want to say that I really thought that event was an, 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 it was inspiring. It was, it was moving. It was very successful. Um, and it clearly, it, it clearly moved a lot of people. And, and, and I, I, two people came up to me after that and said they wanted to be on the commission as well. And, and so, yeah. So I. I you did a great job. And oh, I got to watch it. Oh, I mean, it broke my heart not to be there, but. Um, it was great to be able to Heather watch Heather drafted a script for me. <laughs> Heather, is, boy, if you want somebody on your committee, you oh, yeah, absolutely. To every detail. Oh, my God. I, I mean, great. if it weren't for her, I'd probably end up doing blue jokes or something like no, that. No, you were very so. funny. <laughs> you, were, you had a nice balance of being really funny, but also being really poignant at times. And you did a great job. It really went itself. It so so. yeah. Well, I want to thank you for spending so much time tonight. Right. Your stomachs are probably growling because we've been talking so hard. Of course we have, Thank you for all of your hard work. Thank, Thank you both, you. really. I appreciate you've been annealed in the fires of human rights. <laughs> and here in and, uh, and I like we're, that. We're a lot better off for your service, and yes. and and particularly for this council tonight. So we'll, uh, you're would talk to us about. Hopefully we'll we'll make this actually, you know. Hopefully, make the Human Rights Commission an effective organization. Yeah, I really wanted to succeed. Exactly. That's fine. You need your championship, and yeah. I really appreciate the fact that you've been champions. Yes, thank um, you for all the hard work that you both do. We know. Well, I'm not afraid of you guys, so thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Stay warm. Yes, right. Yeah. Too. Stay the holidays. healthy and safe. My
care. Your holidays are over. Know, wait, yeah, you've yeah. already survived your holidays. You're home from the holidays. <laughs> I'll be the official hugger. Jesus. Oh, that's, that's oh. great. I believe she actually uh, she has a cloak for that. Thank you, I did. Not the day I was supposed to come back, but I made it back. Thanks for everything you guys. Thanks for all your good work. Well, we'll, we'll keep talking about it. Yeah. I, I'd love to be on your committee again. And I'm going to be around in March. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love that committee. <laughs> and I said I, it had to be shared with somebody else on Human Rights Commission. No problem. Talk about that. Hey, everybody needs to get that way up here. Are we up? Yep, you're up. <laughs> and I want to thank you for coming back. I really appreciate that. I do. I'm Bill Dwight. Nice What's your name? Henry. Henry. Go yeah. ahead. Dan McCarthy. Dan, nice to meet you. I'm Bill Dwight. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Good holidays, you guys. Thank you. You too. You too. He's more exciting this time. A little warmer last time. I know. Sorry. See, it was a good thing I said to Bill, please be on this because I'm not sure about the other counselors, so it worked out great. So, anyways, you just met our council president, and he's our city councilor at large, Bill Dwight. I'm City Councilor Mary Ann LaBarge from Ward 6. And I'll let you go ahead and talk about what you planned on talking for today, which was you're going to talk about the updates on the Harrison House, correct? Right. And Gandera? Yes. Me, and Maple me, Avenue? Sure. Let me start with Gandara. That would be probably the biggest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you're acquainted with us or. I, I am. Yeah. Okay. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I think the Gandara Center, um, as you know, start, have started, uh, it's, it's been about, what, two, three years now? It's been about four years. It's coming years years. with Harrison, yeah. and then we, we've worked with um, the Prince of the Homeless to do Maple Street, and actually we're starting a new project, which is a house on Summer Street with the, associate, the uh, Alliance for Sober Living which is uh, uh, an association, an alliance that actually was created many, many years ago as a result of the Harrison House, where there was going to remain in the community. Right. Or not. And so uh, I've, been, I wasn't, I've been on the board for about three years with them. And as um, people wanting to you know, uh, establish a more, uh, it required a lot of hand-holding for the property. And, and since the agency had grown a fair amount at the Vendara Center, then it was uh, decided by the board to merge the, so that then the house became um, a, a program for the Gandara Center. So we have another eight rooms that we provide services for people in recovery. So that's one of the things we're doing. Um, the, both, uh, both of the properties that we have here at, Besides the, the Harrison House, they are actually going to be connected to a case management service. So, um, so we will have uh, substance abuse case management provided to the residents of the of both facilities, so that when they um, come into the program, there is more resources for them. There will be a needs assessment being developed for them to see where they are. And then an individual service plan gets created um, with their goals and objectives and a way of facilitating their reentry into the community with a uh, way of creating history of being able to pay their bills and do all the necessary things so that eventually they can move on to a place where they choose to live on. So, so that's... So, um, so they get also get those two programs actually get support from Harrison House because there's Dan working with them as well, so that they have the the ability to call the program if anyone in, seems to be in trouble or they may uh, follow the wagon. That in fact Dan and Wayne both are available to bring them in and try to seek um, assistance for them. We are also connected to CSO and their outpatient services through the hospital as well, so that there is a lot of uh, support being provided so that they, we can 
keep them sober. And, and, and we understand also the whole idea that we're try we really try very hard not to have them lose housing because once housing is lost, then there's a real issue. There, there's the probability of really um, um, begin to use again is much higher. So we try to, in Harrison Household, we try to find a way of keeping them. If there's a way of doing it, we try to do that. And the same thing with the, the other two programs. So, Henry, in other words, before they go into the program, it is understood with them that they cannot do anything to do with alcohol or whatever. Yeah. Correct. And if they do, Correct. then they have to leave. Well, not well we initiated a discussion about whether or not it's the appropriate place for them to continue to live. You know, right? um, okay. do, do you mind if I say, if we go back some time ago, around 2008, 2009, you guys might remember Cooley was in a position where um, it was going to be pulling out of the behavioral health. Yes, I remember that. And, uh, I just want to say that thank goodness for Gandara at that point, because we at the house, at the Harrison House, and at the Alliance, this is when this whole process of reevaluating where were we going to be connected, how are we going to be connected, how are we going to be able to continue doing what we were doing, and we were reaching out to people, asking whether or not they were interested in uh, partnering with us in that. And uh, Gandara stepped up. Henry joined the board of the Alliance for Sober Living. I was on the board at the time. And there were three other members in the community who were serving as board members. Uh, all of whom were interested in getting off the board. I mean, it was getting to a point where there was a lot of work that was required and people were just losing interest in doing it. And about a year ago, a year and a half ago, we approached Henry, the board did, and asked whether he would be interested in assuming, um, really, uh, the Alliance for Sober Living into Gandhar. It was a way that we had of keeping that sober house alive and functioning so that it could continue to provide access to the living beyond Harrison House, you know. Mm -hmm. The distinction between Harrison House and these two sober houses is we're a DPH-funded residential treatment facility. So we're licensed and contracted by the state. When people leave Harrison, they're independent variables. And uh, the largest problem, both keeping people in the house and preventing people from staying sober when they leave, has traditionally been housing. And I'm sure you guys know this is not the easiest time in the world to find, you know, affordable housing. So the availability of these two houses is a lot of us really, when I look back, I've been now managing the house since 2008, and many years ago was associated with the house myself. You know, if you look at what we've been able to do over the last five years, we've in fact created a, I would say, a recovery community in this town. You know, that has grown from the house, has brought people in from the local community. Um, the number of men who've been through the sober houses and have gone on to rent properties inside this town, remain employed in this town, and support the recovery community in this town has really expanded the community at large, you know. And that's been something I think that really has taken off since, you know, the support of the hospitals kind of waned in 2008. So it's really been a credit to Gadara, I think, that they stepped up and, and took, you know, took an opportunity to become involved in this whole thing. Not just Harrison, not just the two houses, but really supporting the local recovery community too, which run up from these three places. And, and you guys, it sounds like you meshed very well. We did. And that, and that your, your, your requirements and, and conditions and criteria are, are in concert. Yeah. That, that and mission, clearly. Yeah. The, yes. Yeah. It, um, actually, it's, I, I, it's significant what you point out is the establishment of a community, a community, a support community. And um, I, I like that fact because as, as opposed to just being a way station where and then somebody else goes off to move somewhere else, and it's, it's, uh, I understand that there are people in any community who consider that people who have substance abuse issues are just unique to an aberrant group and then once we get the aberrant group out of the way then we're fine because the rest of us good folks can stick around not recognizing that we're talking about people who are related to us, people we went to school with. People. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, sorry, but no, no, go ahead. to attach to what you're saying, you know, if we look at homelessness, for example, there are somewhat similar uh, arenas in many ways. You know, not every homeless person is permanently homeless. We find a lot of people slipping in and out of homelessness depending upon their socioeconomic conditions. Much can be said of the same thing, you know, with relating, if you related to substance abuse. Not all these men are, you know, chronic substance abuse. Right. You know, what, what's happened many times is people have slipped into something because of economic and social conditions, and given the right kind of support, can also slip out of it, you know? Mm -hmm. And just to go back to something Henry said, because it's been something we've had to look at since we started running these two sober houses. You know, there's this fine line between enabling and helping people. Right. And when it comes to paying rent, 
and uh, you know, and being able to pay your bills on time. You know, we've run into problems, or then run into difficulty. Those that have come to us and asked for help, and have get and have gotten the support of their peers, um, have found that they can get through those times of difficulty. We work with people like that. Then there are times where people have a very difficult time coming in asking for help. And sometimes the best way to help people is to say, you really need to address this problem. If you can't do it, if you stay in this building, you don't pay your rent. And that's a life lesson, you know. Difficult to deal with at times. We've not had to do it too often, but there have been times where we've had to have those conversations with people. Even if they leave the building, doesn't mean they leave the community to support around them. That's the critical thing, I think. You know? I think that there's a, there's a real effort in trying to um, almost restructure not only their lives, but also their kind of really their brain in some ways by doing the things that are pretty seem mundane in some ways, right. like you know, waking up on time, signing out if you need to sign out, doing your laundry. All these things, if, if they are done consistently over time, and that's why there's a correlation between the ability to remain sober and the ability to remain in a program a longer time. Mm -hmm. The longer someone stays in a residential program, the higher the chances of them remaining sober because there's a there's a learning curve. Uh, and there's that all the physiology, all that adjustment to not using, and then you have all that relearning, all this other stuff. So if we can extend that while they are out mm -hmm. and they graduate to an, a sober situation, then that really provides a, a longer opportunity for them to be able to, to really be more successful at doing it. Now, where do your caseworkers come from? They come from, uh, actually, their, the office is in Holyoke. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually have um, a program in Holyoke and a program in Leeds where we do um, uh, case management services. And there's also case management on site at Harrison House. So what Henry's alluding to myself and, and my coworker Wayne being available, you know, it's not uncommon that we'll stop over at the house and stop in, have dinner, touch base, pay phone call, we go pick the rents up there. There's a real kind of interconnection between the guys and us. When they leave the when they leave Harrison House, if they've been at the Harrison House, because mm -hmm. it's not exclusively Harrison House, men and women are available at these places right. as well. But um, there's a close connection between we don't um, we don't stand over them with an authoritative uh, stance, but we're available for help at any time. So in addition to the case management that uh, Henry provides through Gandara, we also provide that at Harrison House and we're local in town. How, how, many, how many people do you serve on average uh, a year? Well, I just looked at the stats. At Harrison House, we, we bring in and turn around between 40 and 50 men a year. Mm -hmm. Average length, we're 17 beds. Uh, average length of stay on five months. Uh, there's six men right now at, at Maple Ave and eight over at Summer Street. That's actually, that's, uh, that's significant. That's Pretty good. Yeah, it really is. You know, for a small community like this, we're able to provide that support. You know, it really is. Do you anticipate or look forward to expanding? Um, <laughs> that's, 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 I guess, uh, yes. I mean, there's a need? That you yeah. see in the, in the valley uh, in, in in Northampton. To, uh, I think that the the housing need is really very great in terms of really um, um, people who are challenged with addictions and because if there's any connection with the criminal justice system uh, that they have, then the, the harder it is for them to find them. Right, they're, they're, they get bumped from federal housing. And yeah, get from and, the, and, well, and, and, and even landlords who right. uh, you've got quarry well, reform, you know, yeah, sure you're right, right. for hours, you know. Yeah. The most difficult hurdle, I think, uh, men and women face moving from a treatment facility into housing is um, economic, it's, it's expensive. Yeah. And the other thing that they face is many people have gone against some, some sort of or another uh, uh, criminal right. <laughs> misbehavior. Right. And so, you know, when people go and apply for housing in the marketplace, they find that they're often um, not treated as well as people who don't have the same kind of background. Right. We try and allow people opportunities that they wouldn't normally get in, in, in the marketplace. Right. Are they married? The no. No. Mm -hmm. no. I, 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 I think, I mean, and I um, beat this drum frequently, mm -hmm. but the, uh, I mean, the, this is one of the bigger challenges that we have. I mean, we 
there's a difference between affordability as the, as the federal government and state government yeah. see what affordability yeah. is and the actual affordability for people with it, who, who, particularly in these circumstances, need to make a uh, transition into homes yeah. and the availability of, of yeah. uh, rents or even... You know, there are agencies in town who do work together on this, so it's not as though we're the only two people. Right, right. You've know, okay. you got the Home City Housing that does that, SMOC works hand in glove with us, half, half is a player in town that really go, I think, out of the way to help people in situations like the clients that we work with. So I would say there's a fairly active housing community in this town that does do a lot of support for the kind of people that we see coming through our programs. You know? But you asked the question, is there room for more? Absolutely. What were the names of that again? Happen. What was the others? Home City Housing and uh, SMOC. They're they're all involved in assisting people to find affordable housing in the town. Okay. The um, does Solderon get all the veterans? You guys have veterans too, or you... we do get veterans in our in our facility. Um, I, I think Soldron is exclusively a veteran. Yeah, in the United States. States. You have to, in fact, have a certain kind of veteran status in order to qualify for admission up there. Um, they have a lot of men up on the hill. I think 100, 150, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere in that neighborhood. So they provide a lot of service. Cherry Street also yeah. is a veterans program. Two streets down from us. We share meeting times sometimes with one another. They're a great program. A lot of, a lot of good men have gone through that program as well. Um, again, they face the same problem we do. You know, affordable housing in the community. Yeah. Big problem. Yeah. I, 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 affordable housing. Yeah, Northampton is not. It's Springfield is even. I think is probably worse than. Really? We there's we we have two programs. We have one program there where we have 42 uh, males in one residential program, and finding a, affordable housing is. And we have one program right now that is similar, which is Miracle House which is an SRO. Mm -hmm. It's funded by half. Um, but it's very difficult to, to find. That's what the what the, they clamor for, is really a place to, to move on to. Do you, Henry, like, if you should see, say, like a house for sale, do you buy it? Does your agency buy them, or do you just rent them? Well, um, most of these programs, like, for example, the Alliance uh, in Maple Street. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that the rent is so low in order to make it affordable okay. that if you if you had to pay a mortgage, uh, it might be somewhat prohibitive. So um, I think the Alliance is going to be very well in terms of, but they also has, have received a fair amount of assistance from the city and, you know, in terms of renovations, making sure that the facilities, because if not, there is really, it's very challenging to buy a property and turn it around to uh, to make it, uh, and I'm not sure if the new codes. The stretch codes. Huh? The stretch codes. Yeah. Yeah, the, it does increase the price on it. Correct, so if you end up needing a sprinkler system, depending on how many people you have, then, then it becomes a real, so. The Alliance was in a, really uh, unique and sort of fortuitous situation in that the, the rent that had been paid over the years had brought the mortgage down to a point where, you know, I mean, it, 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 the building was affordable. Do you know what right, I'm saying? Right. Um, to, to go, uh, and thank goodness, friends of the homeless collaborated with you guys to purchase the, the, the house on Maple Ave. And I suspect that the seller collaborated as well on some level. You know, I mean, right. it was an uh, interest on his part to <coughs> work I think Peg people. knows the whole story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Peg knows it. And, yeah. and, and also there was a system from the city. Yeah. So I think all of it makes it happen. It's um, because we, we, leave, we live from hand to mouth right. in some yeah. ways. Every, you know, we, uh, there isn't a foundation of any sort that, that these resources can come up where we fundraise for things that would enhance the programs um, and make it better and some, sometimes is, um, um, is very difficult to, to buy properties because you're 20% down, you have to, and some properties require a fair amount of uh, rehabbing and making it livable. Do you do fundraising here in Northampton? We do, we do basically fundraising in the Valley. In um, the Valley? Yeah. So we, we were involved in the yeah. Valley Gives. Yeah. Yeah. Valley yeah. Gives, yeah. It was great. Hard to find a 
C3 that wasn't. No, that's true. That's true. Right. 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 That's true. We, we also have a walkathon, an annual walkathon that we we uh, we do. So we raise probably between twenty and thirty thousand. And when uh, when is that? That's usually at the end. Of the last weekend of September is when we do it. And where is that held? That is held. The last time it was held in Chicopee. Actually, we're trying to find another place to do it because Springfield. We used to do it at uh, at the Forest Park. Yeah. But yeah. the city decided to uh, wanting whatever if any fundraising, uh, ten percent of any proceeds that Go they would park. take. They get take. They're, yeah, they want. They got that percent. casino madness going. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, uh, the city. The same they way. want to taste. What okay. about Northampton or like up in um, Florence, the La Park? No, I think that that's that's all of those yeah. places that we're going to be actually looking at doing. That'd be great. See, one of the advantages of Harrison House, I think, has been that it traditionally has been funded through DPH funding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, as long as we maintain um, the facility the way that uh, uh, Department of Public Health Bureau of Substance Abuse Services wants it maintained. We can continue to get the contract in the state, which allows us to operate without. I mean, there's clearly need for additional funding at a lot of different levels, but what we get from the state enables that program to survive. You know, as long as we meet the licensing needs, which we've been doing equitably since we began years ago. Yeah, and who knows? Maybe the fortunes of DPH might improve. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Unicorns will graze in the water. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. but but actually, the spiraling crisis, it seems to be diminishing. So hopefully, social service agencies that have been taking enormous hits in the last few years have start to see a little bit of a rebound in funding. I think that the challenge um, with the state has been essentially the way that they are reprocuring everything. Right. And um, I don't know if you know anything about the 257 law. That's it, good. When Patrick started um, his um, as governor, he agreed to provide fair rates for human services. Mm -hmm. And that turned out to be a um, essentially a good thing for providers because we, you know, sometimes you get contracts and you don't get paid right. any raises mm -hmm. for 20 years. Yeah. Uh, the rate that we have for Harrison House is then probably more than 10 years old. Uh, so, but what happened is that they essentially increased the rate of having the same amount of money, so you're going to be able to serve less clients right. than what you have. And for some contracts, because there's no money, they haven't implemented that. So you are serving the same clients, the same couple of years. With higher requirements for the same amount of money. Yeah. But I think the, the silver lining of all this is that it's, a, it's really sort of put back on people like myself who run programs like this. The need to evaluate what you're doing and how you're doing it and are you doing it well. And if you're doing it well, we now have statistics that can demonstrate that. Like 65% of people who come through our program graduate. What that means is they actually complete the program and move on to a successful sort of aftermath, you know. Um, we have uh, almost 70% of the people who come in homeless are leaving with a place to live. We have roughly in the high 60s percentage, we get these stats back from the state each month, showing people who are coming in unemployed leaving with at least part-time work and, and many times full-time employment. So we can see the outcomes. You know, we can measure them through the data that we get. And I think programs that are doing that kind of thing, that are demonstrating those kind of outcomes, are going to be well situated to benefit from these changes that are taking place in funding. Well, so it's a challenge to, to keep your game up. And, you know? and it basically compelled consolidation similar to the one that you guys described just now that you had. Um, and maybe on some level, I mean, there are those who probably suggest that the, the shakeout is, uh, uh, you know, the cold, the weak ones from the herd, mm -hmm. although it's kind of social, social yeah, Darwin. Yeah. Darwinianism that freaks me out because I really don't think I think I think it's forcing everybody to do what they do better and be more mindful of how they're doing. What they're doing. And well, how that's do they get to their jobs? I mean, they have their own cars and stuff. Some men have their own vehicles. Some men are probably wise not to have one for a while. Some people can't have a vehicle for a while. It depends. But the local community is really the place that most people get back into the employment uh, arena again, which means that a lot of that is happening right here in Northampton. Yeah, you know, within walking distance of the house, more than likely. I think what's surprising is that there is a community in Northampton that it's amazingly supportive yeah. to their recovery community that is not, 
is not branding it in any way. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's it's doing a lot of the underground work to support it yep. in the you know the uh, French. The local Dunkin' Donut uh, franchise has been unbelievably supportive right. of really? so many of the men who come to the house over the years. Well, yeah. Summer yeah. Street, and Summer yeah. Street, yeah. 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 No, but that's I mean, it. it's uh, right, right around the corner. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But you know that that is a real um, community link. It yeah. truly is. You know. And, and what do um, they do? They give them donuts and stuff. Well, no, no, people, people get hired as workers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. That's it's excellent. Just, yeah. and, and I, I think, you know, what you were describing is the, and I, I agree. I think the thing, um, when Harrison House years and years ago, predating at, at this mm -hmm. point, there were there were there were neighborhood resistance and there was a community resistance on some level. Um, fortunately, uh, more considerate people prevailed in the end. And then now, it's not, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, I mean, I'll, I'll give us this, that we we adapt, recognize, and embrace, ultimately, those are the, the way we, and, and that it is, it is not a phenomenon, it is not something to fear, it is not, there is no, uh, it, it, this is, the house has been in that community longer than many of the people. Who yeah, but they, well, that's. I mean, I, I know that's true. Exactly. Yeah. It is. Uh, the, the house is now one of the longest tenants. Yeah. yeah. In and I. And you know, Owen, to his credit, has come over and had dinner with us. You know, we've worked with the third board people. You know, sending out pamphlets. You know, we've gone up and down the street with uh, local uh, property owners and helped. Uh, you know, pick up the leaves. And so there's been this kind of ongoing over the years. You might remember yeah. this. You know, the curbstones. Right. The yeah. Trees were planted. You know, there's been a long, and I think Phil, Phil Rugo, who was my yeah. predecessor, you know, established these linkages with people in the community so that it was not an eyesore, one of those places over there, you don't want your children walking by, and it's been very successful, I think, over the years, and, you know, my job is to make that continue to be the case mm -hmm. in the local community, so we've done a pretty good job, and the local um, uh, property owners have always been calling me and asking whether the men are available to do this or that, and we always get out there and work with people. It's been a good experience, it really has. Yeah, and, and I think also, and, and, you know, it, it helps the men in the, in the program yeah. as well. And, and, and really that's the richness of, of the, you know, the interchange is that um, they themselves become more comfortable even with the neighborhood, yeah. with sure. the people, yeah. and it, it, the stigma in some way really thins out uh, right. because of that so that they yeah. can actually feel better about themselves. That's and, excellent. Yeah, so it's a, it's a really very positive experience. I will say this, that as a, as a program director, uh, I, never, I never had a hard time filling that out. There's always people wanting to come to North Hampton. If you're going to go into treatment, North Hampton is the place to go. So, and that, in some ways, is a good thing. I, I absolutely agree. I actually had this point pride. So I'm down with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, is there anything that you uh, would like the council or see the council do that you might feel is that could be a benefit, mm. you including know, getting out of the way, which is another problem. <laughs> thing, so. I've never felt the council's actually been in the way since I've been okay. there, to be honest with you. Like I said, Owen's come over a couple yeah. times and we've created a good dialogue. He actually came over and had a little civics lesson with the men before the, uh, the election was in for the first time. Did he he about, well, you know, I mean, it is true that um, a lot of men at the House. Uh, often don't see how they're going to be able to participate in the political process until mm -hmm. they get a politician who's interested in speaking with them about that. And that invigorated them to get out and get involved with the work pamphlet and campaign and all that stuff. So it really was a pretty good thing that he pulled off. The only thing I guess I would think of, and it's something I've been thinking about doing and I haven't done, is, you know, um, there's if there is a local chamber of commerce where I might be able to talk to some of the local employers in the area and suggest that, you know, the guys who come from my house uh, are coming back to my house every night. The one thing you can almost be assured of if they're living at Harrison House is they're going to be at work the next day, and if there's an issue with them in any way, you can call me. There's someone reporting. Yeah, that, that's right. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I think that that's something that may take our program to the next level if we can work in some way in the club with local employers. There is Those a chamber of commerce. To do it. Yeah, there, there is a chamber of commerce. There's yeah, also yeah. the Rotary. Yeah. There's also the uh, Business Improvement District, although sure. they don't necessarily put the... But I think actually the chamber is an excellent. There are great employers, by the way, up on the King Street area and throughout yeah. this entire yeah. community who've worked with the men. Well, you know what the chamber is. <laughs> I know. Just I need to make the effort Suzanne to get out Beck. there and meet people and do that. Just ask for Suzanne back. Okay. Go in and talk with her. She's wonderful. Yeah. I think we'll do that. Yeah, I, I think yeah. being able to.
create that sort of connection, one yeah. way or another, would take us maybe to the next level and helping people get the, get employed, and then that helps them find housing. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I have to get my two cents in. I, I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew them because Harrison House, I think, has been an unsung hero in the community for many, many years, just doing its thing. And people were so brave and courageous to realize there was next steps needed from Hairston, so they created the Alliance program. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful to Gandhara for helping Alliance move into the next iteration moving forward. And Maple Avenue House that Friends of the Homeless purchased, I think has probably been the most seamless program transition ever. There's somebody that lives right behind it, you know, didn't even know it was there. So um, this whole community that's being created is so wonderful. And I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew that they're doing their thing because it's a huge contribution to the inventory. And when Yvonne Frachero raised the money for the Star Avenue, Yvonne's house number one, and flipped it out to ServiceNet for chronically homeless, raised money again, partnered with Gandhara. Uh, the meeting last week, she's continuing to be that successful in her fundraising that she's setting aside housing fund number three. So nice. not, not really sure who's going to be able to benefit, but um, it's this smaller, scattered site programs with support services in our community that I think is the win-win, and we're just so grateful to you guys for your efforts. Well, you know, it's kind of ironic, right? We do good work when you don't hear about us. That's well, yeah. true. <laughs> because just, I tell people and I say, who are they and where are they? Yeah. That's actually one of the signs of your good work, yeah. actually. Uh, but unfortunately, given the fact that you could benefit from, from right. donations and other things, it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. it's, but I, I, the, the very fact that you... Um, as Peg described, it seamlessly meld into the community and it become part of the community and actually reinforce and bolster the community. I think that um, I'm glad that you recommended that we meet you guys. Right, because I know the first time that Peg had talked to me about having Henry come in, at that point they were just looking at a site mm -hmm. here. So you really, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, you got, you know, I know. You have the yeah. key to sitting yeah, all right there. Right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And all my money. And all my money. Peg has a huge treasure. <laughs> <office, guys. laughs> yeah. And I'll go to Peg and I'll say, who should we bring in now, Peg? You know, because I'm always looking for new agencies mm -hmm. and that. So she mentioned about bringing you back again. And I said, it's excellent. Because we haven't seen you, what, in about a year? Henry. Yeah. yeah. Henry, about a year. Yeah, that's right. Well, Henry runs the big show down in yeah, Springfield, does. and I, know I don't even know how many programs. And yeah. Dan's I'm just the local satellite operator. Dan's the local guy, yeah. the day to day. So it's a good team. Yeah. I think one one of the things that we're looking at bringing that has really nothing to do with substance abuse is really um, we were awarded uh, about four or five years ago a contract to work with. It's uh, it's called it's a a specialty for the Hispanic community and to work with fam Hispanic families and children with severe emotional disorder Whoa. and to provide a wraparound service. Um, so we are actually looking at Northampton and looking at Greenfield to actually extend those services so we're um, working that out with, uh, with agencies to do that. Mm -hmm. There's a dire need for that. Yeah. Oh, great. Well, I know. thank you so much. Thank you. You're, you're, you're among friends. <laughs> thank, you very well. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Come back next year. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a great holiday. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Peg. Thank you. I mean, two months in a row. Wow. Is that? I've made it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.
this show. Yeah. 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 Um, I just want to introduce Kit McDermott, um, who was highly recommended from Pat Keller about bringing Kit in, and he's new to social services and veterans affairs, and thank you for coming back. So, why don't you talk to us and give us some information about what's going on And this is Councillor Bill Dwight, he's our council president. Sorry about that. Um, about, I've been here for almost five years, um, we're on a top street, and we're back in the work of the church, in the art gallery of council services, and she can call me out, and send me an email, and I'll meet with her, Chris, and we'll bring this stuff up. And so we live on Main Street, and we see all this going on on Main Street, in terms of, you know, all the homeless folks, and you can see it. Happy holidays, thanks for coming. Happy holidays, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have, don't lose that coffee. People in the coffee shop. Which one? And I got frustrated. Every one. I just asked friends, would you know that you're going to see the people in the So, and because we were looking for faith based communities and see what involvement they had. So he went out and he brought back five. Four of them were so big that it was like in Los Angeles and Atlanta, it was like, okay, we were one day like that. And, um, but there was a small one called The Open Table. And it was started in 2005 by a gentleman named John K. Todd. It came out of his experience of working um, in the shelters in the Phoenix area. And <clears throat> at one time, one of the guys asked if he could come to church with him. And so he said, sure. And they had, when you're in the West, I don't know how much you spent time in the West, but the church is going to be 5,000, 18,000, here can places. So they invited this gentleman. He was there for a couple months, and people began to say, um, so we take him back to the, to the ship, where he was homeless, actually. And then we say goodbye, we'll see you, and we'll hope it works out for you, and that kind of stuff. Said, We've got to do more. So John, <clears throat> through a whole series of conversations with people, decided, what if we built a community around uh, a person, a family, a couple, a uh, single person, and begin to see if we could help them uh, get off, get out of, of where they are, get back on their feet. And so they did. And uh, they built a, that's the reason, the reason they call it the open table, is because it is, the model is very simple. It's building a table of people who are <clears throat> volunteers, um, uh, and they've been doing this now for about seven years, volunteers, but they have different skills, the kinds of skills where they could uh, help somebody with, with um, if they've got past warrants, uh, if they, um, if they uh, I didn't realize, for instance, that homeless folks have to pay taxes. Uh, and so when they get off the street and they want, they get their lives together and they want to get a Pell Grant, uh, it's not so easy to do. When they, right. and, and I've actually asked a couple of people and said, what? What are you talking about? I don't make any money. Okay. Um, so it was like they spent a year and they watched two things happen. One was the people on the table who are just people who have jobs and companies and they work they have general skills transform as they help this person uh, get on his feet and actually for the first time in years be able to have a life that he had for a long time he had not. Um, and they were amazed at that, that what actually happened. And the people, they're just, they were amazed that they were actually able to do something that was, and the resources that were available in the larger community. So for us, it was like, well, what we love about it is it's, a, it's transformational, and it is communitarian, meaning that you get people in the larger community to be able to see what some do. He said, Dennis, who would say, look, these people need to get back in the workforce. They've got terrible teeth. Would you be able to fix their teeth? And, they had people coming out of woodwork who would do that. And uh, so... For free? Mm -hmm, for free. For free. They would do it for free. And uh, getting the tax problems taken care of, getting cars uh, uh, given to them, getting 
uh, finding ways to get them back in school, deal with the warrants that they have, and get, be able to get before magistrates and be able to get those uh, vouch safe for them, be able to get those charges dropped or certain lessened. And well, in seven years, they are now in 14 states. We just happened to find out that John was going to be in New York, so we asked him to come up uh, about uh, a year and a half ago and just talk to us about the model. And he's an amazing man. He was really great to just listen to him talk and very real. Uh, but he's also a, he's a zealot for the, for the model because he's seen it work now over and over and over again. And, and so we said, well, uh, we'd like to try it. What do we do? And, you know, we're just ordinary people. We don't have a lot of resources, but we know people getting to know people in the community and um, in our business circles and all that stuff, so we'd be able to do it. So he showed us what to do. Uh, and the, it's, it's, it's quite simple. I'll just give you the mechanics a little bit. You just stop me and ask questions. Um, the, the, they usually recommend that the candidates pick through referrals. In other words, that they found that through experience that the best candidates, particularly if they've had uh, trouble with alcohol and drug addiction, is they've been in uh, sobriety or in recovery for 12 to 18 months. Uh, that those candidates were the ones that seemed to work the most. And, they, and again, that was by experience. So you work with case managers, and I originally talked to ServiceNet folks there at first. Um, then what happens is you get trained by, the, the other thing I like about it is they have coaches who have been successful in the open table models. And so they assign a coach to you, and you uh, are coached in, okay, here's how you do this, here's the mistakes you made, here's what you, you should not do. So you form the table and you get trained uh, uh, from the people as you begin to um, uh, get a shape of who the person is and what the person is going to need. And you look at everything from all kinds of health issues, uh, health benefits, uh, housing and life skills, uh, just community life, how do they live in community, how, what kind of community they need built around them, transportation issues and the other issues that I, that I mentioned. So you've got people around that table who are doing uh, we're providing that. Um, there's a psychological evaluation uh, that's actually a very common evaluation that they use. Uh, it's a battery test to help really just one thing. Uh, is this person or these for this couple or this family, particularly the adults, are they ready to actually face change, face the fears? John says, unless you've been in this situation, you have no idea what it feels like, where it's like the world is completely separate from you and you have no way to break into it. It's just, it's just, and they don't, they're not used to community. They're not used to people helping in a sense of people becoming their team. And so it's like, and, and just volunteers particularly. So um, he said that, that, so we do the testing and, uh, and, it, and the testing is very accurate. It's been around since the 70s. And it, it shows, yes, this person is ready. If the person is not, you sit down with the person apparently and you work through what they need to do to, in order to be able to face this psychologically, continue therapy or whatever it is mm -hmm. that they need. And then the door is open to them again, so it's not a matter of just sort of moving out and sort of moving on there and talking to them again. Um, but they just want to make sure that this person has the best chance at dealing with the kinds of stresses and pressures they're going to have to face in themselves, even when there's a team built around them or supporting them. Um, so then, then, once you do that, then um, you have three meetings. And I love this. What he does is he says, well, you invite them, for when you finally have a candidate, the person, well, they call the brother and sister Martin Luther King idea of um, we are a brother and sister's keeper because we are a brother's the brother and our brother's sister. So we're no different. So what we do is we sit down with them over a meal at a house, at one of our houses, and, uh, and we tell our stories. We tell our stories so that we're not coming above you, we're coming beside you because we're broken in our own ways. Mm -hmm. We've had these problems, we've had these issues, we've struggled these ways. We're no different. It, given the same circumstances, we've made the same choices or whatever, based on what family people grew up in or whatever happened to them, and all that stuff. And that, he said, what that does is it, you know, all of a sudden it's like you're not the caregivers coming in. There's nothing wrong being caregivers amazing caregivers out there, but you are now that person's team, you're that person's community, and you're giving time to be able to, um, to care for them and, and walk with them through this. So that's all you do the first meeting. Next week you get back together again, you give the person a chance, if he or she or they want to, to talk about their story. 
He said, usually what happens is they've, they've seen that everybody is so sort of honest and real with them that they're willing to tell the story because nobody's not going to do what. We're all in the same situation. You have one more meeting after that. Um, and again, it's around a meal. It's around a community. doing it at home. Uh, and then the next um, meeting is really about uh, saying it's, it's a little bit of, okay, so here's what you're agreeing to do. You understand that we're going to give you some uh, pieces of paper and for you to sign. It's not legally binding, by the way. It's not a legal contract or something to be sued. It just says you're really, he said, there's something important about people being able to write something down and saying, well, I'm willing to do these things. And it really is, from their side of the table, taking responsibility to the best of their ability from one week to the next to be able to do it. So, um, and you, but you give them another week to think about it so that they can work it through. And then the team, we talk about what our responsibilities are to them. Also, he said that, that over the years, what they've learned is that to safeguard the person and to safeguard the team, uh, there has to be, they have to be a referral from whoever is the case manager is, does, gives a, a candidate release so that they're saying we're fine with it, with, with, with that kind of thing. Um, there's a release of liability from the brothers or sisters uh, the brothers, and they, they're not liable, and we're not liable as well. So this is a voluntary thing we're all doing together to the best of our ability. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a criminal background release so that you make sure, and by that time, he said, people's trust has been built, and so they're willing to go, okay, I'm willing to do this, because we're saying, okay, we're going to find a way, if you have some un un warrants that are outstanding, we're going to find a way to be able to do it, and they've done it, to be able to help you work through these things, because now you're in this process, and, you're, and you want to work this through. So uh, it's those things, and then um, uh, what's called, as part of the change process, there's something called PPE, a PEPQ, which is personality, it's a psych evaluation to say, here's your personality, here's how people have stress, here's how to do this, here's how to do that, things like that. And it just helps you kind of look at, okay, and that's, they've gone through all that, so that by the time you're actually moving forward, you go, oh, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, there's also a, well, I already talked about that. If there's any litigation, we need to know so that we can get um, somebody, a lawyer, to begin working on those things. And if there are any tax problems, we get a tax lawyer or a tax accountant to be able to start working on those things. But the issue is, what are the problems? That meeting is to be about what are the problems that we're facing? What are the problems are you facing that we need to address? That we need to, before we can even get in the process of you getting ready to get a job, if, you're, if you have no place to live, where you're going to live, because there are all kinds of resources around here. So that may be easier than, than we thought, but the point is that that we want to make sure that our job, especially said for the first six months, is really problem solving and is helping them say, okay, we've got this obstacle, what do we do? Not what do you do? You need to take care of that, or but we're going to help do that. They have something called a, a software called Basecamp that during the week, so you meet a couple hours a week, and then if there are extra things you're supposed to do, you do. So for instance, if I have an available car and uh, the person needs to get to get some medication or something, I think the doctor's important, I agree, okay, that's my job. I make sure uh, uh, that he or she can get there. Or, or any, uh, any other thing that they need, each one of us has different jobs. But during the week, we're strategizing on base camp. Okay, so I know somebody over here who actually knows how to do this, I'll, I'd be willing to talk to him or her and see if that person would be willing to be involved. And say so they do that. So all this work is going on behind the scenes in the team, and then when we get together, it's we've already, we're offering solutions. It's, well, what do you think about um, this or that? And the other person has been doing things as well. So it's like, we're doing, we're doing this together. He said it usually takes about... Uh, they go from anywhere from eight months to a year. He said the first six or seven months are the most intense because you're facing the biggest problems uh, and, and overcoming the biggest hurdles and the obstacles in the way. And this person is beginning to trust that, my goodness, you guys are doing these things and you're helping me. And they're actually doing the work as well. Um, and, then, and then he said after about a year, he said usually what happens is the person is working um, sometimes for the first time in years, actually has a place to live, um, has a car to drive, has transportation, and now has a community that they know these people have all become friends. And he said those relationships of the very first ones and the ones that I know about, those people are still in contact 
with each other because they've got friendships. That nobody in my whole life has ever done this. They've taken that amount of time uh, just as volunteers to be able to do this. And so um, he said it, it, they learned the hard way. There were mistakes, and they, you know, he didn't know, I mean, he was, he was in marketing and advertising in New York. He wasn't, wasn't like, uh, in social services at all, but he had this desire. There's something we have to do. What can we do? And as I said, there, there are no, we would be the first open table in New England. Uh, there are none in, the closest is in the upper New York State. There are 14 other states where there are not open tables. Primarily running out of churches, although he doesn't make it exclusive that way. He just, just that's the way it works because that's his community. And um, uh, so we want to be the first one. Um, we were a little naive at first, and so I think I had a, a team, but it, it didn't really hold together long enough because I didn't know what I was doing. I know more about what I'm doing now and in terms of what I need to be able to do that. Uh, so I wanted, when I talked to Peg, she, she was excited by it, and I wanted to, uh, wanted to be able to tell anybody and anybody about and this is, you know, this is what, this is part of what we want to do to be part of the conversation and part of all the work that a lot of people do to help folks get off the street, get back in their lives if they can, and, and overcome some of the, well, first of all, the horrors that they did. And he said, as he said, he said, the most, the most remarkable thing he's seen is transformation and this idea that people actually do care and that friendships get built. And he said, when I, he said, when I first, I, you know, I walked across the other side, when he said I would walk across the other side of the street from all this person, I didn't want anything to do with them. You know, their I wasn't in the world, they weren't in mine, I didn't, I, you know, felt awkward and that kind of stuff. And he said, he said, but something changed there. And then you find out that people, and they've got histories and they've got families and they've had, they, they believe like we do, they're people, and, and they need help. And not everybody is always willing to take the help, but more people are than think, I think. So. Well, the prospect of help is, is significant enough. And, yeah, yeah. And I, and I would imagine that the reason it's successful in faith, in communities of faith, is there's a community. Yeah. So, uh, and a, and a so network, good. a network that would might not be available to other means. Yeah. Yeah. And we all know people who know people who know people. I work with a guy who knows somebody over there who is willing to do that. And, and I think people people are still pretty charitable. They still want to give and try and help somebody do something. And your example is the right place. Oh, it really is. It's amazing. It's the, amazing. The, the, yeah. the psychology vetting. Now, of course, yes. one of one of the a major contributor to homelessness, of course, is uh, mental illness and, yes. and substance yes. Uh, yes. dependence. And uh, are they vetted on that level, or just vetted on the, yes. the extent that they, whether they determine whether they're going to be receptive to That's this? The two things: determine that they're going to be receptive, and number two, the PPEQ really looks at all kinds of personal factors, including drug and addiction stuff. So it's a very, it's a, it's a, a, a standard tool that, that right. psychologists use. So it does. Yeah. I mean, my concern, of course, is the the possibility of actually having. Such there might be such rigidity that that you might find that. Yeah, th that's a fair question. He didn't sound like yeah, he didn't make it sound like in his experience they're just sort of popping people out like crazy. Right. And, and it was more that if there's any way we can do this, and it really is for the persons if they fail again, then it's like I, that it just makes it worse for them. Right. They keep failing and failing and failing. Right. Compound failures. Yeah. So he made that. it sound like there was. Uh, that the reason you, he said, the first one you should do should be easy. Easy in the sense that you haven't got a complex psychological right. problem. Everybody's going to be like, uh, what are we doing? This is way over our heads. There'll be somebody who really is is down the road a bit in terms of, I want to get back into, into the game. And then being able to do the first one like that. He said, that's what it was for us at first. He said, then, he said, we were, we were more used to knowing what we were doing, and then we started taking on cases that were harder to do. Um, you can, by the way, go to the website, open table, uh, www. Open. Well, there's, yeah, there's two open tables. One is a uh, reservation is booking app, but then it's... <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, that's the sure truck. You've got to go to the back door of that one. <laughs> 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 yeah. uh, and and you, so you can see, kind of see what they're doing there, and they explain the, the model and all that. And John loves to talk about this stuff, so he's, he would be more than willing if you wanted to get background information about that from him, too. Hmm. What it sounded like. Um, 
and for family security. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's loading up in our super fast <laughs> free motor. Very slowly. I mean, and, and, you know, in fact, actually, this dovetails nicely with the conversation that we were having with the gentleman previously. Yeah, I just, just um, But of course, they're doing something similar in many respects. They're building yeah. a community. Yeah, yeah. They're they're taking people. I mean, and and you know, I think the group that you're talking about that you want to help are the people who who have gotten in a position where their problems seem insoluble and that, that they they there's nothing. Uh, many of the things that might be keeping them back are the things that seem so daunting to tr on when you look at them collectively. Yeah, yeah. That you're the all the horrible things that you experience, and then plus as you become farther and farther removed from a community, you don't necessarily have a clear understanding of what your prospects are. Particularly, I mean, it really is appealing to think that you know strangers would be helping somebody who would then become friends mm -hmm. and that he, so it's not something that's just like I'm going into an office someone's gonna say well we'll, we'll get to you in a moment yes. we'll see what we can yeah. do and then yeah. good luck to you afterwards here's right. a bunch of paperwork to fill out yeah. good luck to you exactly that's... so how many people do you actually take in uh, you mean at a, on a particular table yeah well I think th this was the, this was the idea what we wanted to do was we want to do the first one and then we wanted to help others. The idea is to help others do them. So in other words, you, um, you're not the only people doing them. And so he said that is, he said it's grown virally, and it's down in the southern states and up a little bit up in, and up in the in the west. He said that's the idea. So you generally do. We would probably do just one person at first, and then we would. Do, we could do two more tables, and then what we want to do is talk to some of the other churches in town and say, would you get, listen, we've done this, we can help you do it, would you like to do it? And so they get the church community involved, and then I talked to Chris Carlisle or St. John's and Steph Smith, and uh, they're, they've shown interest as well. It's like, well, if we can get this rolling, what can we do, and that kind of stuff. So it would be like a viral, just getting people to do it more and more and more, and that's how they grow. The, yeah, by the way, it's the open table yeah, the org, open table. as opposed to open table .org, which okay. is a group uh, filling doing farm shares and mm -hmm. mass. So, yeah, <laughs> okay. it's, it's a little different. Yeah. The open table, and um, so so we're 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 going to uh, get back into it and start again. Try another time. I know a lot more than I did before, and just see if we can get them going. So you did. I, I, well, I, I appreciate your courage on this, in this respect, and your charity, actually. Yes. That I, I, it's, um, and to that extent, again, and I'd ask the same question. I mean, think, uh, what level of support can you use from the community, from the city? Um. And you don't need to answer that now. I mean, it may be something to consider. I mean, you know, we. It's connections. I yeah, think, I mean, the connections we could do. I mean, we don't have a lot of authority, and we don't control much in, by way of money. So yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't yeah. even thinking about that. No, but I mean, I think for but the connections thing. Yeah, connections with people, just getting being part of the dialogue, being part of the conversation, and looking at resources, people resources, people yeah. who what okay, we could because we keep in touch with the people we know on the street, and we're always looking. Is, is this person ready? Is that person ready? Sometimes you think they are. Sometimes they're not. Just like, not sure, but there are. Uh, so it's really the resources of people doing this stuff, and who have a lot of experience and know about it. So we could grow and then begin to do them. So we uh, we don't want to be sort of over here as as we're doing our own thing. We want to be a part of the conversation, a part of. Well, I think the probably like with service net, you've got Pat Keller with yeah. you know housing yeah. and. Yeah. Well, I suspect that's what I mean. One one of the things that. We actually have a lot of social service agencies here, and there's some overlap, and there's not actually, fortunately, it's a pretty strong network, so there's not redundancy or necessarily. That's great. Uh, right, you have Starlight up in Florence. I mean, yeah. they're good, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing that appealed to me was the, not, not that it's filling a gap in our inadequate social services system as much as 
the peer part of it. Right. Yeah. Because to be a long-term friend and a supporter moving forward is a boundary that agency yeah. caseworkers are not yeah. supposed to cross. Sure. So Absolutely. it's the whole thing yeah. of us being a community where there's so many people with solid life skills that also have a desire to give back. And they do the few hours for the meeting and whatever they do outside of it. I'm thinking once they identify the needs of the person that yeah. we can help him fill that table because you guys know everybody. So Do we? Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it really is the whole, it's the holistic piece. It's, yeah, that's the thing. It's we all want. of it. It's, and what agency can really do that anymore? No, I, 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 Community that, Action that, used to be able to, nobody could deal with the whole of it. <coughs> but it's, it needs to be, the, the, the part that sings to me the loudest is just what you described, is uh, getting to, well, but it's actually establishing a, a community. It's, and allowing beyond someone who's collecting a check and who has the next person coming along, sure. the next client coming along, and you have to dedicate your time, you have to allocate your time in, in, in small, tiny portions. This is people giving over, being available, mm -hmm. and I think you're right, that, that actually, that's not something that could be prescribed by a government that can't lay out something like that. And I, I, that's, that's what sure. I like about this that's a lot. True. That's true. It's, it, it, it makes up for a deficit I, I never even considered, actually, to be perfectly honest before. I didn't either. I just was frustrated. Uh, and I said, gosh, and knowing that, by the way, knowing that there are social services out, agencies out there, but like we're on Main Street and we're going, well, but we can do something more than just do what we do, which is a fair amount, to help somebody actually get out of it, right. and out, exactly. of the, out of the cycle. And so that's why we, let's go out on the internet and see what's going on. I think it's it's great because I think it has that special touch hearing that you go to somebody's house, you're having supper with them, That's right. and you're talking, yep. and yep. it's the it's connections, yeah. yeah. It's like the, you know, you're going to be our neighbor. We're, right. neighbor. we're neighbors. Are they were taking the care of a neighbor? Yeah, it's taking care of your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so we, <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to take another shot at it, and you know, we can continue to get connections. And, that's what we'll do. I, I, was, I, was, I was talking with ServiceNet, and that was really working with them. And they, but they said to me, the, the counselors that we talked to, we don't have somebody who is ready to do this. So it was like, and I didn't paint a picture like they need to be able to. It was all. I was just like, you know, here's here's what we're trying to do. And you no, know, nobody. At that time, that right. was that was nine months ago. So. Mm -hmm. um, well, there's actually there's a few people on the streets now. I think who would be. We have one who comes to our church, but I think yeah. he actually, I, I actually told her about it. I said, well, she's listening. So, yeah, there's, there's a few people that I know out there who would actually probably be. I think they will come once they hear more about it. I agree. I agree. I think it will just get so, so you need, you need a low-hanging fruit person. You need someone. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. You need someone right. who's going to... Be easy pickings. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And you, because then it encourages everybody. They go, oh, okay, this works. If we take somebody who is so has had such a horrific life and just can barely get up every day, or is putting a needle in his or her arm all the time. That is, I mean, it takes a lot of people to be able to help somebody to even stop doing this. Thing. Right. So yeah. somebody is like, yeah. would somebody help me? Would somebody help me overcome the, the obstacles that I've had? be able to get in, into life. And structurally, how does it work? Say I am homeless, okay. who do I go talk to? In the, I mean, is there a point person who... Right now you, it's me. It would just be you, then, me, so far. Right now, yeah. And then you would try to um, create sort of a custom or a tailored um, network of people for them? Yeah, what would happen is, is I would... Uh, I would, I, first of all, I'd want to find out, um, I, I, want, I have to get to know the person's son and just sure. hear a little bit of, of, of what they're looking to do and why, uh, without going too deeply into that, I don't have a right to have that, but just where they are. And then I would want to form the table. 
And then I would talk to John about it because I'd want to be coached the first one too. So I talked to him. What happens as as a church? What we do is we will uh, there's a there's a, a fee that we pay. It's like four hundred dollars to open table. That gives us the base camp and the coaching around the country. So that's but we do that. Nobody else on the table does it. That's just ours. Mm -hmm. So we do that and then we go from there. Uh, and then we'd be coached and then we would meet. We the person would have the evaluation and then we would meet. Mm -hmm. Well. Yeah, I, I know some people. <laughs> she does. I have think some you contacts, do. So, yeah, I'd be glad to help on that. Project. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. So, and, but you know, and if it comes to it, then there's something that the, um, and I don't know what, and once again, the separate group, we don't know what it is that the council would do, but if there is something that, um, I, I mean, I, I this is this. Sounds noble, gracious, and courageous, <laughs> and ambitious, yeah, and, yeah. and ambitious, and I think it's doable. Yeah. Well, uh, then I'm relying on that. <laughs> for, yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't do it. I, I, would. I, I had some stuff to learn, and I learned it, and now it's okay. This is how it has to work, and that's how it will work. I think you will do fine. Yeah, I'm sure. So we're gonna try. As you can tell in your heart that you really want to. I do. I want to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I want to yes. Well, you went to the right connection right there, right away. So already your networking skills have been added. You know, right, and she sent you to us. There you go. Yeah. I mean, that would be the first person I would send you to anyway if you were to ask me on. Yeah, yeah so, we had a great conversation. Yeah. Well, now that I know you're ready, I'll get you in the room okay. with the service providers, and it's probably be mostly the folks at the resource center and see if they can come up with some people to be the participants and then we can think about who else who the network can fill the skill yes. set. That'd be great. That, that would yeah. be that'd be more than I could ask for. Yeah, actually there are a lot of uh, the, we have a, a wealth of actually of people who are uh, particularly skilled in any number of the categories that you described. Right. So. So. Yeah. And that's how you guys can help because you can't put an email out and say we're doing this, come forward. It's the tap on the shoulder, it's the I really thought of you when I heard of this. Right. It's the one on one kind yeah. of invitation and I think there's a lot of cloud here that you can utilize. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. That's great. Thank you. Well, well Kit, thank you very, very much for coming. Pleasure. Yeah. And yeah. Have, have a happy holidays. You too. If you guys should listen to me, I look forward to getting the new book there. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Peg. Thank you. Have a nice holidays. Thank you. So, Thank Peg, it's going to be like minus two where you're going. I'm going to be good. All right, sounds good. See ya. Yes. Yeah. Okay, then. Let's call it in. Okay. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. 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 Thank